Hope the recording is on. Everything works as it should. I'm waiting for an OK sign from the room and then confirmation from Budapest. Hi, a warm welcome to everyone. My name is Andros Banet, and I'm very pleased to present you our latest webcast about a wonderful new opportunity, a great new EPSO exam, which is presumably the last one this year in 2022. And that is about assistance in safety, security, EPSO exam. And this is the, the exam we're gonna be discussing to walk you through the different requirements to pass this competition and eventually to land a new job. We'd like to make sure that you're familiar with the interface, though many of you may not be, uh, it may not be the first time that you're participating in a webcast that we run. But for those of you who are, why don't you type into the chat box where you are dialing in from so we get a broader idea where the participants are joining us today. So do that, type that into the chat box and that chat box will be used to ask questions about the, this particular competition, about the exam. Feel free to ask those questions anytime throughout this live session. And then later, if you might be watching this as a recording, you can send a message to us through the customer support and we'll make sure to follow up. For those of you who are at the live session, we will try to answer as many questions as we can. If there is anything that I cannot answer right here, or I may not know the answer, we will make sure to follow up in some form. So let me just take a quick look from Portugal, from Rome, where else? Why don't you type that into the chat box? Let us see who is dialing in from, from the furthest away from Brussels. So we take a look at that from Spain. Okay, probably that's the winner so far, and hopefully there are others as well. So very good, let's get started. We have roughly about an hour and I'm going to describe this particular competition, the preconditions, and share with you a couple of practical insights and ideas, tips, how you can make the most of it and land an EU job. So with that, let me see if the clicker properly works. Okay, was that me? That was me. Okay, so I go further about my background. I used to be an EU official for seven years. I worked at the European Court of Justice at the European Commission. And for about 11 years, I'm dealing with many, many things, among which the most important being is helping candidates like yourselves pass the EPSO competitions. I have a book and we have the EU training website and we try to provide all the resources to help you and assist you in succeeding. So with that, in case you missed something, as I mentioned before, we'll make sure that you receive the recording within a day. You will also get the slides, the presentation I'm using right now, and you will also receive or you will get access to a full transcript of uh, today's presentation. That's gonna take a couple of days, but it will be published online on our website. So watch out for that in case you prefer reading about this. Now, this reminds me to, to add a word of caveat or, or a disclaimer that whatever I tell you is obviously to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we're trying to be as accurate as humanly possible, but legally speaking, the real authentic source of information is EPSO's very own website and the notice of competition as published in the official journal. So with that, let's uh, say just a few words about how we come to talk about EU careers and how we come to talk about EPSO exams, EPSO being the European Personal Selection Office competitions. So we have a pretty robust community. We've been around as a company and as a service for uh, 15 years. And those who have used our services and those who have passed the competitions are often still involved because of career changes or other interests. And they, they really nurture, they power this great community of uh, EU career enthusiasts and those who are interested in getting a job. So you can tap into that community. We are also very grateful to this community for sharing a lot of information with us that we can then package and present to new candidates like yourselves. We have a pretty uh, active and, and, and solid community on Facebook, not the least on our Facebook page, but also on the dedicated groups 
where, which are created for specific competitions, including this one. So if you're on Facebook, you might want to look out for that and join those groups because candidates share information, updates, and other news. Also on other social media, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, we are present. So join those communities and make sure that you engage with us. So aside from these various uh, social groups, we have a pretty robust set of questions and tests which we make available to candidates, not the least verbal reasoning in all 24 languages of the European Union, and a, a pretty great variation of tests, over 17 million have been used by our users over the past many years, because these tests are randomly generated with the focus of a given competition and the requirements that EPSO had put forward. We have a lot of uh, webinars, which I encourage you to check out. These webinars are partly free, some are paid. Many are about methods, so methodology and how you can and should optimize your performance for these competitions. This is very much evidence-based and based on our experience that we're sharing with you, our coaches, our trainers will give you shortcuts and very concrete practical tips so you can make the most of the competition and not just get scared when you are there on exam day, but you know in advance what to expect, you know which methods to use to make the best use of your time. So with that, what else can I share with you? A special exclusive offer, which is something we, we often give out at the end of a live information session like this one. It's going to be a discount code at the end of the live presentation. And even if you watch the recording soon enough, because it's going to be valid for two days. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. So with that, let's actually look at some very practical aspect of this particular competition, which is a question might be on your mind. It may not be the, the number one concern, but for all intents and purposes, where are you going to end up working? Geographically speaking, it could be Brussels, Luxembourg, or Strasbourg. In more practical terms, it tends to be either Brussels or Luxembourg, and perhaps even more likely that it's going to be Brussels, given the number of EU institutions located here and the, the, the nature of the duties that this competition gives you access to. So with that, Another aspect of where you're going to work is which institution may end up hiring you. This could be any of the EU institutions, so from the European Parliament, the Court of Auditors, the European Commission, the Council of the EU, Economic Social Committee, Committee of the Regions. Any EU institution will be able to hire you from the reserve list that this particular competition aims at or puts you on. And this leads me to explain that just like any other EU competition, the aim is to create a so-called reserve list of successful candidates. Only those who are placed on the reserve list can then be recruited into a specific position. So the actual job profile and the actual institution and the actual vacancy that you will fill will only be know, known once the reserve list has been created. And that's important because today we are describing a selection procedure and I'm sharing with you ideas how to make the most of it, but this is not about a concrete specific vacancy that you're applying for. So this is important because the whole mindset is optimizing your performance for a competition and not targeting your focus or not looking at a very concrete job for which you want to be hired. Having said that, it, there's still a pretty specific focus given the nature of this competition. So it's not a generalist one, it's a pretty targeted one. So I'll walk you through all these aspects and then ultimately, as I said before, the recruitment and the specific institution that hires you will be decided once the selection process has been concluded. 
So let's look at the application part and let's see what you need to be aware of and a couple of tips when it comes to languages, general and specific criteria, and get you a better understanding how to optimize your application to increase your chances of success. So the first one is to look at how many positions are there available. Now this is publicly known information, it's in the notice of competition. So as you can see that there are basically three profiles. So this competition runs under the same reference number, which also means you need to pick one of the three options that they laid out. So if you are in a, in a position, given your background, given your work experience, that you would qualify for two or perhaps even three of these, you need to make a pick. It's important because otherwise you, you would be disqualified. And perhaps you also want to be a bit more focused. I would assume that those who are, who, whose background falls into the first two categories, so operational security and technical security, that's somewhat close. So there you might have that dilemma which one to apply for. And those in occupational health and safety, that tends to be a somewhat different background. Regardless, you need to make a choice and pick one of these. As you can see, operational security has 44 places on the reserve list. So by the time the selection process is concluded, that's how many candidates or by that time laureates will be placed on the reserve list. For technical security, you have 24 places and then for operational, or sorry, occupational health and safety, you have 33 places. And that gives you a rough indication about your chances of success. Certainly, we don't know at this stage how many applicants will there be. That's an information that APSO usually shares far and wide, but only after the application deadline has been concluded. That application deadline is on the 20th of December, so roughly a month from now at the time of this live event. So a little over a month, make sure that you do not leave your application to the last minute, that you fill out everything you need to fill out, that you click the right buttons and you make sure you get the right documentation or background information, even though it doesn't necessarily have to be in your hands at the time of the application, but later in the process, you would need to have those justifying documents about employment or diploma or other professional certificates. So 20th of December, and uh, that's a pretty straightforward deadline. As I said before, do not leave your application to the very last moment. What will you do? What actually is, is, is the job about? So a few words on that before we get into the, the, the requirements that you need to fulfill. So the job description and the description of the duties for each profile is in the notice of competition. So there's a bit more detail as to what you can expect you will be doing as an EU official in the position of an ASD3, dealing with these particular broad areas, and then very specifically in the actual job, your day-to-day -day job of what you can expect. It's not just EU institutions that employ or can potentially employ you in these profiles, but if you zoom in a bit and say, okay, which, which parts, which directors general or which departments or units would actually be needing this sort of service? So it could be the Office for Infrastructure and Buildings, it could be uh, sensitive uh, foreign policy issues, it could be about trade, or it could be really about the physical safety of certain premises and, and facilities or the occupational safety or health and safety about EU staff. So there are very concrete ideas out there. And just to give you a rough idea, we listed a few of these for uh, operational security, technical security for occupational health and safety. I'm not going to read these out. These are there for reference. You can take a quick look. And I presume those of you who are at this event and listening to me right now would already have a, a, a more specific idea as to your career prospects and as to your expectations of what you will be doing as an EU official. So I leave it up there a little bit. You can take a look as to what to expect. And um, 
you will report back when you are already placed in an EU job a couple of months from now, so we can refine the slide for future editions. So moving on, let's actually look at the very practical side of the selection process and see whether you're eligible. What criteria do you need to fulfill to actually be successful and land on the reserve list? There are some general conditions. So there are three general conditions. You must be an EU citizen, pretty straightforward. Number two, you need to have completed military service if that is a requirement in your country. And the number three, which is a little more relevant in this particular competition, meet the character requirements of this, of the kind of job that you'll be placed in and the, the, of being an EU civil servant. For this particular competition, given the fact that it's pretty sensitive in many cases, and it's listed or, or mentioned in the notice of competition, that it's likely that you will be required to have or undergo a clearance. So you would need to be cleared for, uh, for, for, for security in the sense that you need to have a security clearance. So you'll be able, legally speaking, you'll be able to work with sensitive information or sensitive contacts, and that would require that sort of security clearance. So again, this is not necessarily something you must have at the, at the moment of application, and maybe not even at the moment of employment, but they will require that from you once you are hired and they will advise you about the procedure. So this is usually not something that you need to have in your hand to be successful in the competition, but it's something that you need to know in advance that you'll be required to obtain. Now, aside from the general conditions, we have, if my slides comply, which they do not right now, okay, we have certain language rules. Now, language rules are quite straightforward, but it's worth pointing out a couple of, um, couple of, couple of, uh, sensitive points around them. One is that there are two languages required. There's a language one, and then there's a language two. Language one, and this is pretty default these days in most EPSO competitions, can be any of the EU's 24 official languages. So if you speak uh, Spanish or Finnish or Latvian or Romanian or any other EU official language, you can choose that. This is completely independent of your citizenship. You can be an Irish citizen and choose Finnish as your language one, entirely independent and it's entirely up to you. Me as a Hungarian, Belgian citizen, I could choose French, I could choose Hungarian, or I could choose Bulgarian if I spoke Bulgarian. The other precondition or the other language requirement is about language two, which needs to be either English or French. So it's something I'd like to point out. In some other competitions, they would sometimes require only English, but here they give you the choice between English or French, and certainly language one and language two have to be different, right? So you cannot choose English for both, you can choose French and English, in any combination for these two, entirely up to you. My usual piece of advice about languages is try to choose a language one in which you can process information very fast. So if you can read and calculate and understand information quickly, that should be your language one. Language two should be a language in which you can express yourself at ease. So if in spoken and written French, you're more fluent, you're more comfortable versus English, then perhaps choose that. All of this, obviously, if you speak multiple languages and you have that luxury or the flexibility of choice. But having said that, there is a bit of consideration and, and it has certain impact as to how quickly you can sit the abstract, verbal, and numerical reasoning tests, or how quickly you can draft the, your reply to a case study 
or express yourself at the situational competency-based interview. So with that, uh, as I said, language one and two must be different. And essentially, that's all to be said about the languages. If you have questions, I encourage you to put that into the chat box. And I'll take a moment very shortly and answer some of the questions that have come in so far. So let's look at something which is more tricky, more complex, and usually is the source of a lot of questions or, or, or misunderstanding, or at least some, some, some issues there, which is what qualifications and how many years of work experience do you need? Now, there are quite a few variations, permutations there, and we try to summarize all of that on the screen per field. And by field, we mean operational security, technical security, occupational health and safety. So field one, two, and three. So field one is what you see in the screen and also in the notice of competition, they gave you a, a handy table about that. It largely has two variables. One is, do you have and in most cases, you need to have some dedicated, focused qualification, which corresponds to the nature of duties, to the, to the activities of that particular profile. Or you do have some qualification, but it's not in the list that they put out there. And then actually, there's a third variable, which is how many years of work experience, relevant work experience, do you actually have? So it's, it's a kind of a combination of these three factors. Is it a relevant qualification? Is it relevant but not listed in the notice of competition? And then in comparison to these, how many years of work experience do you have? So once you have this laid out, you have the different numbers. Is it uh, two plus three, one plus four, none, zero and five? So you need to, need to check your particular situation. And this is certainly something that the selection board, which comprises EU officials who are specifically appointed to run this particular competition. So that is something that the selection board would on a case by case basis decide upon. Now there are some very, very clear cut cases. So if you have a dedicated degree in, in, in a field related to intelligence or, or, or physical uh, safety and security, well, that is probably a very relevant background. And then you have three or four years of relevant work experience as well. You're probably pretty safe in the sense that you will qualify to, to, to be enrolled in this competition. There might be some more gray zone cases, depending on what background you have and how that relates uh, to, to the profile. And also the work experience you had, it may have been a kind of a mixed work experience. So it's not that obvious that you, you really did relevant tasks, relevant from the point of this competition. So uh, I wouldn't go into any further detail and, and not just weed out all these permutations but flag the kind of considerations that the selection board would look at and then see how your particular situation and background compares to the official and formal requirements. Similarly to this, again, field number two has quite a few variations, right? It's the same idea of what is the nature of your post-secondary education in terms of relevance and does it appear in the positive list, in the exhaustive list that EPSO has listed in the notice of competition? And then how does that compare to the number of years of work experience that you have and see their, their correlation? So you have a lot of stuff on these slides and it's there for reference. We try to make it as clear as possible and, and, and present the information from the notice of competition to make it a little more easy to understand, which I trust will help you and help your application. But then again, if there is some particular question around this, I'll be happy to answer with the disclaimer that I may not be able to immediately give you an answer, least of all an official answer, whether your degree or your work experience would be accepted 
by the selection board. We're very happy to guide you. We're ha very happy to advise you. And we also have a network of experts who have seen a lot over the years. So we're very happy to do that. But then again, in some cases, it may not be possible because it's the ultimate judgment and evaluation of the selection board. And then field number three, even more text, even more complications. But again, the mindset, the, the logic through which they will examine your particular background is very similar to what I just described. Background, qualification, is it among the ones that they listed? And then how many years of relevant work experience you have? So with that, I think I'll stop here for a second, take a look at my uh, device and, and ask my team to share with me questions that uh, have come in, unless there are no questions. I see there are some comments happening there, which I'm not immediately following from the corner of my eye, but please, dear team in Budapest, let me know if there are any questions coming in that you couldn't answer. Perhaps there are none yet, and you could address those, which is wonderful. So I'll just go on, and then again, if you have other questions, anything that I've covered so far, you're more than welcome to put that into the chat box and it will be passed on to me in short order. So with that, why is this a great opportunity? It is a great opportunity and I probably don't need to preach to the converted. I'll give you a couple of reasons. First, there's certainly the salary part, which uh, EU officials or, or EU institutions offer a pretty competitive and solid salary. We have on our website on eutraining.eu an EU salary calculator. And we're just in the process of updating it and refining it because there's a new formula and new calculations have come in. But even with the current one, you get a, a rough idea of the, the level, the amount of salary that you can expect in this particular position with a couple of variables, whether you have kids, whether you're married, whether you need to relocate from more than 50 kilometers outside Brussels or the place of employment. So there are a couple of factors that have an impact on your salary. You can take a look at that on our website and we did the simulation for you. So given these variables, it could go up to roughly 5,000 euros net per month, which is a, a pretty attractive proposition depending on where you're coming from though, because Europe is uh, pretty diverse in terms of uh, cost of living and salaries. But then again, this is this tends to be a good reason and a, a pretty positive aspect of, uh, of lending a job like this. And aside from that, there are health insurance offered not just to you, there's health insurance offered not just to you, but to, to, your, to your family and European schools if you have children who can learn in, in their mother tongue or in, in one of the languages of you and your spouse. And certainly there are a lot of variations uh, here because it's, it's a pretty international place. But then again, those opportunities and resources are offered to EU staff. Probably the biggest question here, how do you get one of these jobs? What is the way to optimize your performance? To what do you need to study? How, how should you prepare to increase the likelihood of you succeeding in the various stages of this competition and then eventually land on the reserve list and then land an EU job? Well, let's go through each step. The first one is the easiest application process. Don't miss the deadline, fill out everything, Make sure that you provide all the information they require, choose the languages wisely, and go through this somewhat easy, somewhat straightforward administrative part. You create an absolute profile, you fill in all the answers, and on you go. So this is probably the, the, the easiest thing to do as long as you do all of that before the 20th of December 2022. Now, once you've done this, and if you have some experience with EU competitions, you might be wondering, is there going to be a talent screener? Those of you who have never done EU competitions may be wondering what a talent screener is and why am I highlighting this? The reason is for this kind of specialist competitions like this one, 
EPSO tends to use a so-called talent screener, which is a series of questions about your professional background, your work experience, your profile, through which they can get a better idea whether you are well suited for this particular position. Here, there is no talent screener. So they do not do this despite being a so-called specialist competition. So this is somewhat unique, and that is the reason why I'm pointing this out, because others may be wondering, where is that? Is that an omission? Or perhaps there is more to it. That's how it is, right? This is how they, they put it out. This is their best judgment for one reason or another. They didn't deem it necessary to use this kind of selection tool. So what other steps are out there that they actually do use? Well, they use a so-called pre-selection exam, which uh, is a pretty classic way of filtering, selecting out candidates from a larger pool of applicants. What happens here is they require you to sift so-called verbal, abstract, and numerical reasoning tests. Sometimes they're referred to as psychometric tests. Sometimes they're referred to as CBT, meaning computer-based tests. They go by many, many names. Their essence is it's a multiple choice computer-based exam for these three particular domains. In a nutshell, what's a verbal reasoning? It's not just reading comprehension. Verbal reasoning is also about logic. You need to make logical deductions from a passage of text and find the only correct answer. So you have 20 questions and 35 minutes. So there's quite a bit of time pressure there. And you, you, you read the text, you make sure that outside information that you read in, on, 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 in, on social media or in the news, that doesn't interfere with your interpretation of that text. Making sure that whatever is written there makes sense, you make logical deductions, and you pick the only correct answer that corresponds to the underlying text. So it's somewhat straightforward to say. Certainly, the difficulty is to do all of that quickly. So you have 35 minutes and 20 questions, so a little less than two minutes per question. So that requires practice, and that requires a certain methodology. So I'd like to, again, point you to the methodology webinars, which we have available on our website. We have a couple of free ones, and then we have a couple of paid ones for kind of pro level, for those of you who really want to take it to the next level and master the verbal reasoning. Very similar, there's a numerical reasoning, and as the name suggests, it's about numbers. There are tables, and you need to do quick um, arithmetics you need to do quick calculations, pretty much the four basic operations. But again, it's the time pressure that makes it difficult. So quickly finding what you need to analyze or which cells in the table you need to focus on. And sometimes an estimation is enough because that saves you time, but sometimes you need to calculate. Luckily, there is a calculator that you can use, and it's often an on-screen calculator and sometimes there's also a physical one if you go to a test center. So you have that, but it's the time and the efficiency that is, is crucial here. So you have 10 questions and 20 minutes. So here, exactly two minutes per question, but you need to be efficient. And then number three, abstract reasoning, which is about these cryptic shapes and forms that follow a certain sequence, a certain logic, and you need to find the next in the series the different components tend to have or tend to move according to their own, own system. And sometimes two or three components correlate with each other. So if this point is on the top right, the other shape is gonna move clockwise. So there's a logic to it. And the sooner you can crack that code, the faster you can find the correct answer. This is probably the most difficult because it's 10 minutes and 10 questions. So a minute per question, that makes it pretty challenging. When it comes to scoring, interesting thing, there's no pass mark. So you don't need to get at least 50% of the answers right, which again, tends to be a criteria in other competitions, but not here. So if you get zero on all of this, 
you could pass. Well, I'm a little exaggerating. You could pass, but you will still not succeed. Why? Because they do a ranking among all the candidates based on the aggregate score you get for these three exams. So you have a very strong interest in maximizing your score. So the higher your score, the likelier it is that you will proceed to the next stage in the competition. The score you eventually get is not going to be added to the final score that you are ranked upon in later stages of the competition. So this is a pre-screening, a pre-selection test. There's a ranking. And once you are in the top brass, in the top cohort of candidates based on the overall aggregate scores for the verbal, numerical, and abstract reasoning, you pass to the next stage and the score is no longer relevant. Yeah, so it's only for ranking purposes. But then again, you have a keen interest in maximizing your score. And that usually goes through two core preparation methods, finding or learning best practices and methodology, practicing a lot. Same thing as with any sport or playing an instrument or another skill that you need to learn how to do it best and practice the hell out of it. So I would say that the next stage or the next uh, part in the competition is about the eligibility check. So that again is not particularly complicated or difficult. This is where they will check whether you have the right documentation or the proof of your work experience. This is a, a fairly formal bit. And then comes the, the, the actual the second stage the second step in this process, another set of exams in the so-called assessment center. Assessment center, which used to be a purely physical experience in the sense that you had to come to Brussels, sometimes to Luxembourg, and sit a series of exams. Since COVID, this has moved online. So in this particular competition, you will have three types of exams that you will be required to sit. Language, so the language of this phase, this exam phase, as you can see, is language two. So either English or French. Language one is no longer relevant in this case. Assessment center runs entirely in English or in French. And it happens online. What are the, the components? Which exams are you required to sit in the assessment center? Well, the three that you see on screen, case study exam, situational competency-based interview, and the FRI, meaning the field-related interview. So these are the three parts. Case study exam, a written exercise based on background documents. Situational competency-based interview, you get before the exam, a briefing, a text that you are required to read and get familiar with. And then it's a live interview with an assessor. So it's, it's, it's an online live conversation. And then there's the FRI, the field related interview or interview in the field, which is again, a live interview, which, which focuses on your subject matter expertise and your subject matter knowledge. So that is where they truly test and evaluate how much do you actually know about that particular field. What is the scoring? Assessment Center would distinguish between general competencies and your subject matter expertise or knowledge. Though sometimes they refer to it as competence in the field, it's less about competence. It's more about what you know. It's about your experience and not so much about your skills. So with these two, you have the general competencies. Overall, you can get 70 points uh, based on seven competencies, right? So there are seven competencies that they will, they will check you against, that they will evaluate you upon through those two particular exams. So through the case study and through the situational competency-based interview, or SCBI for short, they're gonna get a better idea about your general competencies. 
and you get a score from zero to 70, or basically there are seven of these, each is worth 10 points. So they say communication, eight out of 10. Working with others, seven out of 10. Resilience, 10 out of 10. Accuracy and precision, two out of 10. So this will add up a certain number of points. You need to have at least 35. And then you have the other part, the field-related interview, the, the field-specific knowledge. And that is on a scale of zero to 100, you need to have at least 50 points. So you can see that this is pretty important. This, is, this, this weighs pretty heavily in the overall scoring of the assessment center. And then you do the maths and you say 70 plus 50, 120 points in total. And that leads to a certain ranking. And then the top X number of candidates based on the numbers we've seen before that they are planning to put on the reserve list. So that number of candidates will be then chosen as successful laureates. Once you're on the reserve list, the reserve list has a certain validity, usually one year, but for specialist competitions like this, it could be extended as long as there are still candidates on those reserve lists who have not yet been recruited. And then at one point you are recruited. Happy to report, we have a nice webinar that I, I, I've done some time ago on how to get a new job once you're on the reserve list. So if you get to that stage, do check that out and also let us know that you've succeeded. Not only will we congratulate you, but we'll try to share with you a couple of tips and ideas how you can actually get a specific job and become a permanent EU official. So how to get the job? And before I get to that, let me take a quick look if there is anything that I need to answer. There are two questions that seem not to have been answered yet. So I've worked in the past for one year in Brussels and I'm entitled to the expatriation allowance. As far as I remember, the rule says that you need to have, in this case, moved out of Brussels at least six months ago. And if you spent over six months away from Brussels and your central residence is no longer here and you need to actually move back here for the job, from more than 50 kilometers uh, radius, then you will be entitled for the so-called expatriation allowance, which is an important thing since it's a certain percentage of your base salary. So financially speaking, that's an important part. Here's another one, CBT scoring. How size is the pool for each profile? So how big is, what was the size of the, the pool for each profile? I'm assuming you're asking how many candidates there are in each profile, which is not something we know in advance. We can only guess, but it's not even going to be an educated guess, just a wild guess. I really don't know how many applicants are going to apply for each profile. But the good news is that once the deadline has passed and there is no, the application is no longer open, APSO usually communicates the number of candidates per profile. So at least you will know the number of places on the reserve list and how that compares to the overall number of applicants. So you will have a rough idea of the proportions between these two numbers. Good, let's go back and soon finish up the presentation, how to get the job and a couple of tips beyond uh, or, or on top of the ones that I've already mentioned is consistent practice. Cannot emphasize enough really like a sports preparation, you need to practice a lot. Depending on where you are right now, if you have not dealt with calculations and, and, and mathematics or quick mental calculus for a while, you need to sit the numerical reasoning test. You want to brush up on that knowledge. We have a methodology webinar, by the way, exactly for like a math refresher but it's about the practice to make sure that mental muscle is being used and, and you exercise enough so by the time the exam comes, you'll be fully prepared. And then consistency is another aspect. So not just the duration of your overall preparation, but the regular practice. Depending on which phase of the competition you're preparing for, if it's the CBT, so the abstract verbal numerical reasoning, Focus exclusively on that. Once you have passed that, then focus on the assessment center, read up about the competencies, refresh your knowledge about the specific information in your field, 
practice interview skills. Make sure that you practice your writing skills for the case study. We actually have a simulation on our website that you can do. You can even request a review, uh, a personal and, and uh, manual review of your submitted case study and we provide you feedback. So that sort of exercise is something you want to do based on the exam phase you are preparing for. And then methodology, just uh, like I mentioned before, there is a system to it. This is not just about the amount of, of, of willpower and, and mental effort you put into it, but there's a system to it that you can learn and apply. So there's a methodology for each phase and for each particular competition part. And then persistence is, is not giving up. Perhaps you want to create a study group or join forces with a friend or two and say, okay, if I'm pretty desperate or I'm just, I had enough of this, well, let that other person lift you up. Let that other person get you through that phase and, and, and just keep your eye on that objective. And doing the simulation is an integral part of that. So we are here to help you. We're, we're, we're providing as many resources as, as we can in the form of uh, eBooks. Here's our website, uh, which you certainly know since you signed up for this event. A lot of simulated test practices, practice tests, in, especially for verbal reasoning, the 24 languages are available. So if you want to practice in Maltese or in Lithuanian or in, 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 in uh, Danish, for that matter. So even the relatively smaller languages, we have practice tests available. Check those out and get into the best shape for the competition. And aside from that, lots of webinars on all aspects, both the CBT, so the pre-selection part, and the assessment part as well. Lots of other resources. So we have a pretty robust tips and tricks section with tips on how to make the most of the assessment center, others on the situational competency-based interview. No matter which aspect of the competition you're looking for, chances are we have some resources out there for you. And then, well, to mention the personal coaching part, so we have a wonderful team of highly qualified expert coaches and trainers. You can find them on our website. You can book them. All of them work online, though some of them can meet you also in Brussels in person. So we offer individual and group sessions as well. So if you feel a little uneasy or a little um, intimidated by all of this, we've got your back, reach out to us, and we're happy to, to book a coaching session for you. EPSO community through Facebook, I mentioned earlier. So there's a dedicated group for this particular competition. If you're on Facebook, I encourage you to check it out. You might know my books, so the Ultimate EU Testbook Assistant Edition, and then there's the Administrator Edition, and then there's also the Assessment Center Edition. So I'll leave this discount code on the screen. It's a 20% off all our digital products. Code is 2022 EPSO 155. It's a reference to the competition's reference number. Check that out, 20% off. It's valid for 48 hours, so depending on whether you're joining us at the live session or watching the recording within two days, you can use this discount code. Let me take another look at my little screen and see what other questions have come in. Based on your experience, do you know what's the range of the highest score for the pre-selection test? That's a very good question. So let me do a quick calculation. We have uh, 20 and 20 and, and 10. So I, if I'm not mistaken, but please, dear team, correct me if I'm wrong. So you can get 50 points in total for the pre-selection test. So for the verbal, numerical, and abstract reasoning. And then what's the cutoff? Usually it's around 87%. So somewhat arbitrary number, but again, there are large variations or, or, or very, very variances depending on which competition we're talking about, certainly the number of candidates, the performance of the candidates. So maybe some questions are difficult for everyone and many people just couldn't answer that, which then changes the overall cutoff mark. So if you do the maths, how much would that be roughly 45-ish? 
So 45 out of 50, which is a pretty, pretty high mark. And especially when you take abstract reasoning, which tends to be the most difficult for most candidates, you probably want to have a very good score for the verbal and the numerical reasoning so you can afford to potentially lose a couple of points at abstract reasoning. But it gives a rough idea that around the 44, 45-ish score range out of 50 is where you're rather safe. Let's say you have great chances of passing to the next stage if you reach that point. Another important aspect, which I did not mention early on, when it comes to the assessment center, usually they would invite three times the number of places on the reserve list to the assessment center. So if you have 44 places in on the reserve list that they're planning to, to, to populate with successful candidates, three times that many, so that would be 132 who are invited to the assessment center. So you see, you can do a bit of uh, calculation once you know how many candidates there are to see how many applicants, how many are, proceed to the next stage and eventually land on the reserve list. Here's another question I see. How long does it usually take to be recruited from the reserve list? Is there a possibility for the reserve list to expire and not be recruited? Very relevant question. How long it takes usually depends on the vacancies there are in the institutions. But one thing you probably want to know is when they, they meaning EPSO, launch a new competition and they determine the number of places on the reserve list, they do that after intense discussions with the institutions. So the EPSO board would say, okay, dear European Parliament, dear Court of Auditors, dear Committee of Regions, dear European Commission, how many places would you need? What is our budgetary, what are the budgetary constraints? And then based on all these discussions, they decide that. So this is to say that once you're on the reserve list, it's very likely you'll be recruited sooner rather than later. And that could be one month or six months. So there's certainly some time scale there, but it's rather uncommon that somebody's on the reserve list. They want to be recruited and they don't end up being recruited. And I emphasize this point of wanting to be recruited because maybe your life circumstances change. Maybe you just give up on your dream of getting an EU job or you move to Canada and you do whale hunting. Who knows? You just change your priorities and you may no longer wish to be hired even though you are on the reserve list. So that is also a scenario and that is somewhat considered, but generally those who are successful laureates and they get a call from the institution or they proactively look for vacancies when they can be hired from a particular reserve list, they do end up getting hired. A reserve list can expire, just as you mentioned and I, I, I hinted at earlier, but it can be extended. So they say, okay, even though we don't have as many vacancies as we had planned, and this particular reserve list is, is close to expiry date, they can make a decision, legally speaking, to extend the validity of a reserve list so those who are still on it can be hired. Voila, any other question there? I don't see anything else. And I think in terms of time, we're pretty good. We have a couple of minutes left, which is not to say that I wanna take up all your lunch break or wherever you might be, depending on your time zone. But I'll wait a second or two and see if there are any other questions coming in. No questions beyond this. That is absolutely no problem at all. But if you are watching this as a recording, you're encouraged to send us a message through customer support, and that will pass on to me or other member of the team. So I think with that, the recording, the transcript, the PowerPoint, all of this is going to be made available as soon as possible on our website. Use the discount code. If you can put that back on the screen, it would be wonderful. And I have a huge, huge uh, thanks to share with, 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 with my team for Alex, who is in the room with me and helped with the broadcast, with Aggie and Rita, who made this webcast possible and helped with the presentation and everything. So I could just walk in like a rock star and do the show. And they did everything in the back 
which I'm forever grateful for. So with that, thank you so much for being here. And perhaps the final word, as far as we know, this is the last competition for 2022. So there's no more EPSO exam this year and perhaps for a couple of months next year because EPSO is somewhat updating, changing their system. So there might be a hiatus until next spring, April or May, before they announce new competitions. But then again, it's pretty volatile, it might change, but according to the latest information, there is going to be a bit of a pause before they relaunch a new cohort or a new set of competitions as of early next year. So with that, thank you very much to the team. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us today. You can share the presentation and the code and everything else with, with uh, friends and colleagues if you think they can benefit from it and uh, really get back in touch with us if we can be helpful with information or pointing you to the right preparation resource. Thanks for being here. And I sign off live from Brussels. Thanks. <laughs>